okay. Um, on this little doobicky, you have to hit. This? Oh. Yeah. Count. Okay. Let's see count. This thing is very high tech. <laughs> Time out. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Um, hi, my name is Vinicius. Um, I'm a postdoc at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, um, and I'm working on image classification of uh, marine particles that sink through the water column. Uh, so the general idea is that you can put this big cylinder out to the ocean, and at the base of that cylinder, you can put a trap that contains gel, which allows you to trap any of the particles that are falling through the water column. And thanks to a lot of people in the past who have both measured carbon in particles and modeled them, uh, we can have an idea of how much carbon different types of particles contain uh, based on their ecological province, provenance. So basically, um, if you collect particles and you can tell where they came from and you know how many there are, you can get an idea of how much carbon is falling out uh, from the surface ocean to the deep ocean, which is really important for understanding the ocean's role in the global carbon cycle. Um, so uh, yeah, so this is how like our data are uh, collected um, originally. Uh, again, they're just from a trap at the base uh, of a cylinder that's in the ocean. Um, we need to extract the individual ROI. So there's like millions of little particles, I don't know, hundreds of thousands. Um, and so first we use Im an image processing pipeline to extract all the individual reasons of interest or ROIs and I'll show those. Um, in a couple of slides, but um, this is just describes where our data um, come from and what the distribution is like. So um, on the X axis, we have different classes of particles. Um, that vertical line separates the different classes uh, between particles that contribute to the flux um, on the left hand side and then different uh, just uh, things like swimmers or zooplankton that don't contribute to the sinking flux bubbles are just like bubbles in the gels. Um, so just things that we don't want to count towards the actual passive sinking flux of particles, but we'd still like to isolate and separate so as to not confuse them for uh, sinking particles. And so on the top here, we just have um, the number of observations from each of uh, five domains or sites that we have data from. Um, so the top is just the count for each of the domains. And then in the bottom panel, it's the actual fraction um, for a given domain that belongs to each of the classes. And so the data is very imbalanced. Um, and so that's like sort of an issue that uh, I'd like to work on I'm doing the summer school. Anisha, yeah. how, how hard is it for a human to distinguish between noise and the actual stuff of interest? Um, it's pretty easy. So noise, um, and as defined here, uh, it's just like in our image processing protocol, Sometimes you get like um, ROIs that just contain nothing. And so it's pretty easy to see like this frame contains nothing. Because it's much more noise in some of those places yeah, than others. I think, else, but. right. So that's sort of like, it could be an artifact of the way that we like pre-process the ROIs. But um, yeah, as far as we know right now, it's pretty easy to separate that from everything else. Um, so, okay. Great. All right. So on the right hand side, there is just some examples of ROIs and different particle types. So aggregates are just sort of like um, algal biomass that sticks together through turbulence or just other geochemical processes. Um, all of the pellets are just fecal pellets produced by different types of organisms. Um, rice area are this group of unicellular eukaryotes in the ocean that contribute to the seeding passing flux, and then just a bunch of phytoplankton. So the key like benefit of diagnosing ecological pathways is that you can tell like which organisms or which processes are most responsible for contributing to the carbon flux at a given um, location. So broadly the goals uh, for our project are to um, first just classify like vanilla classification like figure out what the particle is. Um, right now we're sort of proposing a method in which you uh, obtain a new data set and you label a subset of that and then use that subset to like train a model and label the rest of your data just to greatly decrease the amount of human labor that is involved. But eventually we'd like to move to fully autonomous classification in a future where autonomous imaging is more prevalent. And so um, for this, we need to have domain generalization uh, where we 
train on um, on data from different regions and then like use that to evaluate on a target set from a region that we haven't seen any uh, data from yet. And then we'd also like to incorporate metadata um, into our model training and prediction because for instance, like uh, mini pellets are produced by really small organisms and can be on the order of tens of microns, whereas salt pellets are really large, like thousands of microns and can contribute greatly to the carbon flux at a given station or a given place. Um, but when we pass them through a CNN, we have to resize them and we don't want to lose that information about the size. So I'd really like to figure out how to incorporate that information. Um, yeah, so thank you. Any other questions for Vinicius? For the um, preserving sort of some sense of scale or size, have you, have you ever thought just like putting a, is it possible to put a grid behind these? Like is, how is it, is it gel translucent? Could you like slide some sort of uniform? Yeah, so during our image processing pipeline, we actually do like for each image, we have the image data and then we have like, we maintain like the latitude and longitude and the actual, uh, something called the equivalent spherical diameter, which is an estimate of the size of the particle. So we have that information for each image. We just have to figure out how to incorporate that into like the training um, and prediction. Um, do you, have you thought about, uh, so there's kind of trade-offs, I guess, between like incorporating extra metadata during training versus predictions. If you're doing it during training and you're changing an architecture, which makes it harder to start from pre-trained weights. Mm -hmm. When you have smaller data sets, that can be tricky. Mm -hmm. um, but then, you know, then I guess maybe you're not getting the benefit of like less confusion during training time. Yeah. Do you plan to sort of, probably during prediction is the easiest thing to test out. So you can okay. try that first. Okay, cool. Thanks. Yeah, yeah I haven't right, looked well, into it a lot, but it's good to know. Yeah, That'll be you. cool. I, I think this type of incorporating metadata, I think is kind of a general theme in a lot of ecology projects like there's information we have that's not just the images so um uh yeah i think there will probably be others who are doing similar stuff that you can um talk to as well great awesome all right all thank right. you oh can you say can you hit next so we know who's Hey all. Um, yeah, I'm Magali, I'm postdoc at the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences. And um, yeah, the broader aim of my project is to develop a, a platform where uh, we collect and organize camera trap images that are collected by hunters because um, hunters often uh, put out cameras in their own hunting area and they use it for their own, yeah, for their own to, to see what is actually walking around in the area, but um, there's nothing done else with those images. And um, that's a shame. And that's why we want to create one yeah, centralized system in Sweden where all the hunters put their camera images in so that we can use those data for monitoring and um, yeah, to get better information about uh, yeah, reproduction, survival and so on and distribution of those uh, species. Um, yeah, these are some examples of images. Um, yeah, here it's only object detection on, on those images, but um, just to give an impression. Um, yes, I have sure. a quick question. Um, so, do you have, have you, when you're communicating with hunters, have you yes. had any, um, one of the things with US hunters is they often don't want to share the location of like game images where, you know, maybe it's like their secret spot where they like yeah. to go hunting. So, yeah, yeah, we have the same issue kind of. Um, and we are um, integrating kind of idea where you have teams, hunting teams, and they can share within each other images and also the location, but often they know each other's location, so that's fine. But um, for the broader public or other people can't simply, even sometimes they don't watch want them to watch images, so that they're not accessible for public. Or so you have some sort of like delineation yes. of privacy within the platform. Yes, but exactly. the researchers would be able to access all of them. Yeah, we are able to access them, and they are fine with that. Nice. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I have a data set about like 30,000 uh, images that are annotated for five ungulate uh, species that I would want to focus on is red deer, roe deer, fallow deer, elk and white boar. Um, they were collected across uh, more than 400 deployments that were like 
uh, with some geographical variation, as you can see on the map, but still you see there are a lot of clusters. Um, and they all, yeah, those 30,000 images have bounding boxes. Um, and you see here the yeah, kind of distribution about um, age and sex, because the next slide I will focus on, show you that I want to create, um, yeah, identification model that can distinguish age and sex of those uh, five species. Um, so I created a prototyping data set about, yeah, 8,000 images for, for age, um, age model and uh, 8,000 one sex model, um, just to limit, um, yeah, and speed up a bit the process. Um, yeah, so, so as I just mentioned, the goal for this workflow for me is to create a build model that can classify between age classes. So I distinguish between two age classes to make it step start with a bit easier, only juveniles and adults, and um, sex from those camera trip images for those five species. Yeah. Any questions? Yes. Um, <clears throat> thank you. It's really, really interesting. I was wondering, um, do you need to have less than a year, more than a year? Is that for concerns of like population? stability to deal with sustainable levels of hunting or something what? so no, you have um to classify between two age classes mm -hmm. is that so there's not over hunting of yeah exactly hundreds, less than a year exactly so one of the same. goals that we have is um, especially moose or elk which is um yeah important game species in sweden uh we um discovered that in the last year especially with the drought and climate change that there are Reproduction is lower, and often they base the number of animals that should be hunted is based on what is hunted in the previous season, so from yeah. autumn or winter, and then there's still a reproduction season in between that is not considered when you calculate your what should be hunted, and this is where some mismatch occurred, especially with crowd. So this is why, and, and if we have a system where you upload your images and you get quick like identification of the calf and cow ratio, like about reproduction. Uh, we can incorporate this in the management. Uh, that would be great. Yeah. <laughs> this is the main goal, yes. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I'm Alba, I come from the University of Huelva in Spain, and uh, I just finished my degree on computer science, and like one year ago I started working on this team and this project, which is called iSensus, Automated Census and Biodiversity Monitoring System using deep learning techniques, uh, which wants to be a cutting edge protocol and workflow for wildlife monitoring, uh, which leverage a camera trapping, citizen science and deep learning. So we already have a model that is working to classify images of the camera traps, but it's just classifying the image in total without bounding boxing or detection. So it has a lot of errors because it's memorizing the background. Uh, so we want to create a new neural network to detect the spices uh, and classify them. Uh, so we can obtain an unbiased estimation of the spices and the community di dynamics. Um, yeah. Uh, so the prototyping data set, we have the information in TC view with the path, the class, and then information about the location and the date time and also the sequences because in camera traps you have sequences that is very important for the trainings. Uh, and we have 16 classes uh, for the prototyping data set. It has a 25,000 images, and there are some classes that are majoritary. And from those classes, I took uh, 3,000 images. And I had to create a bounding boxes. Uh, I used Mega Detector, uh, and then I was checking them manually to make sure that they were having like the put bounding boxes and creating new ones. And I created the COCO file. Um, so the distribution of the classes uh, looked like that. Um, so yeah, that's correct. For like something like domestic dog, where it's much, much more rare than everything else. Um, uh, yeah, I guess like how important is it for you to accurately predict the rare classes? 
Uh, well, we are thinking about that, but I think the most important classes are maybe the others. They are like the team is uh, currently studying the domestic domestic dogs, and I think they are like doing that, and they are like very interested to find the domestic dogs. But yeah, I don't think it's like the most important one. Just I guess like often when there's this much imbalance during training, it'll learn not to ID those. So. Does every single person in the room have like pretty majorly imbalanced categories? Anyone have super balanced categories? <laughs> yeah, okay, that's what I thought. <laughs> and that's what we want, that's our final goal. So there are some um, animals that are very similar, for example, like follow, follow deer and red deer. So we want to do a hierarchical classification. So instead of saying, like if the model doesn't know certainly if it is a follow deer or red deer, it will say yes, that it's a cervidae and also for the European rabbit and Iberian hare, it will say it's a leopard. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm Jess. I'm from the University of New South Wales in Australia, and my pro for my um, I'm in the second year of my PhD. So I'm working on comparing different object detection models uh, to detect mammals in camera trap images. Um, so before I talk about my project, so there's this thing in Australia we call that that's called acknowledgement of country, which is um, to acknowledge the Aboriginal people or who we call the traditional owners of the land. And so I would like to acknowledge, I would like to begin by acknowledging the Wankamara people of Sturt National Park, which is where I collected my data from, and also the Pedagal people, which is where I conduct my research from uh, at UNSW Australia. Um, so for my project, I, I threw this slide very quickly together. So I didn't uh, include any camera trap images. But basically, uh, for my project, I am collecting data from this uh, study site called Wild Deserts, uh, which is in Stat National Park, uh, which is in the very top left corner of there, of the state of New South Wales, which is where Sydney is in. So if you were to go there from Sydney, it takes about 20 minutes, uh, 20 hours to drive from. It's a very long way. And um, so Wild Deserts is basically a project where we've been working on introducing some locally extinct mammals back into the ecosystems. And so far, we've got around 14 classes of mammals in the camera trap data set. So including um, some, most of them are small mammals. So um, hopping mouse, uh, bilbies, bandicoots, and uh, some more garas as well. And in the data set, there's around 15,000 images. And I have so far um, ran the mega detector on all of those images. Um, I, but I haven't checked uh, about like class imbalance or anything. But I suspect it's pretty imbalanced. Um, have you done any qualitative analysis of how good mega detector is doing for those small mammals? Because I know that's hard. Uh, I've, I've only done like finer scale or just, uh, just like animals and, yeah. um, I've only like put the mammal boxes right. So I know Natty, raise your hand, is also works on small mammals. And yeah. so maybe you guys can talk more about how annoying it is to detect small mammals in camera traps. But <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> cool. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, so as it turns out, Michael and I, we both work on insects and I'm going to steal the, what Michael said, that it's a very bad time to be an insect nowadays, uh, especially a pollinator. Uh, and my focus is on pollinators. Um, yeah, I'm Valentin, as you can see. Um, I focus on um, pollinator detection and classification. 
I work with a very compassionate team of pollination ecologists, and they look at how plant pollinator interactions vary across different environmental gradients like uh, latitude, altitude, land use. Um, and I discovered that while working with them, uh, they spend a lot of time in the field collecting data, killing the insects with a net, you know, and then they spend time identifying the, the, the pollinator. It takes a lot of time. So I thought like, well, maybe there's a way to automate this. Um, and we started collecting data like images with just a simple smartphone uh, mounted on a tripod, like, as you see here, on top of a target flower. And we let that thing run for one hour on top of a target flower, and then we move to the, to the next flower. Um, it's pretty easy to identify the plants because they don't move. There's a Flora and Comita app out there, so you just point the camera at it, and you can identify the plant pretty accurately. Um, and then you move to, to, the, to the other plant, as I said. It's much more tricky with, with pollinators, you know. Um, so we built this uh, humongous data set and took a lot of time to, uh, to annotate. But the prototype for the summer school it's, um, consists of around 6,000 images. I didn't put that information here. Uh, and we managed to annotate around 1,300 individual insects. So by an insect, sometimes I refer to an insect as a sequence because the, the, the insect moves on the, on the target flower. Some, they stay for a couple of seconds. Others, they stay like maybe up to a minute or so if they're just like lazy or they just poop there or whatever, you know, they don't really pollinate. Uh, and then the way I, I thought about this was to, like my my, Unit of data would be the insect itself, um, because I don't want to have like the same images from the same sequence appearing the train test and validation, you know, because that would be a spillover of the of like some redundant information. So I just like if a sequence, if an insect um, appears across ten consecutive images, it's either that sequence appears either in the test train or or validation. So I managed to, to split the data for the for this summer school, and and my goals are. Um, to 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 have like a box detection and then uh, also the sequence detection or the insect uh, detection as, as like alternate synonyms between these two and what you see here is that i, I made like a, a video out of the sequence of images just to have an idea how the data looks like in in real time um and i tried yolo on this uh what you see here is a yolo train on some let's call them internet images from iNaturalist and then tested them completely on this unseen data. And sometimes it gets it right, but sometimes uh, it's it's completely wrong. Uh, it, it gets the, the insect most of the times, but the, the wrong label. So I'm also interested in the in the classification. I just uploaded, I just updated the slides and I see that they didn't up, update it here. I have like, the data set is pretty unbalanced as well. Like most of the insects are hymenopteras, so bees, and then dipteras, um, and um, some other stuff like uh, coleopteras and spiders. All right, that's it for now. Hope to show you more later. You have some classes listed that don't have any training data. Is that just, if you go back a slide? Yeah, like what? Um, yeah, I think I think this is kind of a visual artifact here because I if you have just one individual, sometimes you know, on that background plant, okay. um, then it might not show up ah. clearly here. Uh, cool. But what I wanted to convey with this image is that a lot of the background is well represented, like this plant species, like what's mm -hmm. here, Cardo something. So one plant species, so one type of background is where well represented and others, you know, just appears a few times. And it's, so I guess the important message for me is like, I have different types of backgrounds and just the backgrounds uh, are unbalanced as well and then different types of insects and those are unbalanced as well. So I have two axes of unbalance uh, and characteristic you, on, in my data set, yeah. Are you planning to train a single model that detects background and foreground categories? Are you going no, to split those things up? The background, we decided that we know. When you go in the field, you know what yeah. plants you have there. So you don't need to have an AI for that anymore. Yeah. They're easy to identify. Plants are easier to identify. And you already kind of have 
well-established AI for that, like Flora Incognita, for example, at least in, in, in Germany and works well across Europe as well. Cool. Um, and the goal is for, for instance, because while they fly, they move around, they're blurry, they're small, and all these kind of problems. And we also try to work on developing a camera system like, like uh, Micro. Um, and you have like a hom this homogeneous background, which is nice. The, the goal would be to work with a very messy background. All right, Sicily. Thanks. Not trip. <laughs> um, hi everyone, I'm Cicely. I use data pronouns for reference. Um, so yeah, I also put a logo on the University of Leeds, so you didn't see me use a slide without Leeds logo. Um, and I work. I'm a bit of a anomaly, maybe, because um, I'm on an interdisciplinary PhD program. So I use a bit of computer vision, a bit of political ecology, a bit of social science. Um, so I don't really know how I describe myself as a researcher anymore. Um, so I work on the IUCN described Asian songbird crisis. Um, we're focusing on Indonesia, which is the hotspot for trade. Um, so for this workshop, I'm thinking about using machine learning tools uh, for species identification in bird marketplaces and uh, with the potential aim of enhancing wildlife trade monitoring. Um, so this could be for conservation practitioners, consumers or law enforcement um, it's not really decided for the yet um so yeah i also have an unbalanced problem and um, one of the interesting things about using ai to monitor wildlife trade is it's sort of been done already with um like detection of real or fake ivory or tortoiseshell uh but it's not really we don't have many field applications yet for really diverse problems like with bird trade um so I have a data set for um, 90 species at the minute with a minimum of 80 per class. Um, but I definitely want to try and identify some of the rarer classes. Um, so I did a lot of field work earlier this year in Indonesia. And the most I saw was 175 species in one market in like two hours. So it can be quite um, intense. Um, and that's sort of what they look like for reference. So. Um, they can be very dark environments. There's a high degree of occlusion from the cage bars um, in the front of the images. And we have a lot of species that are declining really rapidly. Um, so, for example, roughly I have more data for the more popular species or for species where there's captive breeding. Um, and the goal, I have many dreams, um, <laughs> but I'm being realistic. So I'm focusing on like a um, single species classifier for now. Um, and ideally with some metadata like this, um, but I did some design workshops, co-design workshops of law enforcement this year as well. So like this metadata, I still need to go through to see what uh, features people voted on the most, um, but potentially exploring few shot learning for some of the rarer species that crop up because um, trapping is basically quite opportunistic. So you can see a big range of species in markets um, and there's also a lot of variation in terms of the sex of species, there's um, some sexual dimorphism, but it's not the same levels for all species uh, and a lot of subspecies as well. And some of those are of quite a lot of concern, depending on who you ask. Um, yeah, so thanks for listening. Excited to meet more people. I think I've got most people's names by now, but yeah, if there are any questions, that'd be great. Or not, you know. Have, there's a lot of bird data sets out there already. Um, yeah. How well represented are these Indonesian species in data sets like not, by naturalists? Not, not, not very, well, very yeah. well, yeah. There's some, um, some in the field. There is a iNaturalist project. It's called like Wild Birds in Cages. Um, but it's pretty small and it only really covers the popular species. So, for example, this species is pretty rare in trade. Uh, it's not there. Yeah. And not everybody knows that there is iNaturalist and it kind of relies on a fairly informal network of birders across Indonesia and not everyone likes going to market so I think and it can be a bit sensitive taking pictures there so yeah. data collection can be quite challenging yeah cool yeah I was going to ask if you had any issues when you were going into public markets and documenting um not really it turns out Indonesian men are quite flirty in markets so <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's a bit, a bit intense um but I normally just explain I can speak Indonesian so 
um, would explain to people that I'm doing a PhD and I'm really interested in birds. But um, the word for bird in Indonesian is also a euphemism for penis. <laughs> it's really fun. So they're like, oh, you like, bird? you like birds, do you? And I was like, oh, yeah, I love birds. <laughs> yeah, so it's quite intense. Yeah, so it was normally like you could build a bit of camaraderie, even chat to people about football because everyone was like, where are you from? And then, yeah, so there's quite interesting ways to like um, chat to people. And because I'm not Indonesian, so they kind of know I wasn't going to buy anything. So they were quite happy just to let me mull around, take some pics, yeah. yeah. Would it also be formative for you to maybe design a system, since you have a rare species, maybe like group them into a rare species categories so that they don't accidentally be clamped into one of the major categories? Yeah, yeah, so <clears throat> I also made like a sort of few shot learning dream data set. So I might sort of try and think about it in two separate models um yeah because there are quite a group of common species that you'll see throughout indonesia but sometimes it depends on the distribution so sometimes you only see certain species in certain markets or like one bird managed to survive from papua to jakarta which is like three thousand kilometers away um yeah so there's quite a lot of factors that affect which species survive high rates of mortality that sort of thing yeah I, it does oh sorry go ahead yeah I'm curious about the application. Like, are you to apply this model that you're going to build? Would you have to go back and collect more data? Um, yeah, so it's sort of still decided. Um, I did collect a lot of data. So I did like um, maybe eight marketplaces and a lot more shops. Um, but I went with a lot of students. So I might do something where they collect a bit more data and do some field tests. Like, I mean, actually, it depends how well the summer school goes. But there is a lot online um, and I might end up having to mix maybe with some like wild images. Um, but yeah, it also depends if it was quite a positive response from law enforcement, but I don't necessarily want to exclusively work with them because they have quite a lot of problems for various reasons. Um, yeah, but this kind of depends. It's quite difficult to enforce at the minute because no one really knows how to identify most of the species. Uh, and it's quite overwhelming like to do it in the moment. It's very like sensory, crazy. Um, but there's also like borders, planes, smuggling. Um, so it's quite a complex system to monitor, yeah. Um, kind of along lines of what she was saying, um, if you imagine a potential future application, mm. is it feasible that um, you could think of the machine learning as more of a filtering process than mm. an identification process where possibly you could ID accurately those common species and mm -hmm. then just do a good job of saying, okay, these ones need to be ID'd by an expert. And then yeah. have a way smaller set of images that mm -hmm. humans need to look through, but it might be more reliable. Yeah, so I was thinking, um, so I worked with some experts and colleagues to do some of the identification for rarer species. So yeah, I eventually would like to work towards a human in the loop system. Um, so something like if the machine isn't super great. Like this isn't the best example, but there's one group where there are 50 species and they all look really similar. And it's like the size of their eye ring that is the difference between them. Um, yeah, so I think there will still be hopefully some integration with experts and that would work better for the system because they don't often speak to law enforcement. Um, but there's a lot of like geopolitical things in Indonesia as well. They often don't, the law enforcement are quite sensitive to the IUCN and like working with experts and stuff like that. Um, for various reasons, um, yeah, but that would be the eventual, eventual goal, yeah. Cool, cool. thanks everyone. Michael. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Michael. I use he, him pronouns. Uh, I work with the Tulalip tribes of Washington formerly research scientist at University of Washington, uh, formerly did my master's at the University of British Columbia. Uh, so I've got this really fantastic network of people that I've met over the years who have given me a ton of data uh, for use of uh, in my project, um, working on mitigating human wildlife conflict with real-time predator detections from satellite linked camera traps. And um, this really hinges on the tool that is provided by Conservation X Labs. This is called the Sentinel. And um, as you can see on the screen, 
you kind of place the Sentinel in the vicinity of the camera trap and the SD reader goes into the SD card slot of the camera trap. And as the picture is taken, uh, you get a real time processing of whatever AI model you've uploaded to the Sentinel. Um, so it's really customizable and I'm really excited to be able to start working with this with the hope of uh, detecting predators in areas of high potential for conflict. So these could be recreational trails, agricultural landscapes, um, really the applications are, are pretty numerous. So as I mentioned, I've got a lovely network of people who have given a lot of data to me. Um, this consists of like a ton of predator images, which is uh, I'm just so grateful for for all of the help that, that people have provided. These were all annotated, so I didn't really have to tag any of these. Um, we've got like 6.5 million images of non-predators. So these are 40 to 50, maybe maybe up to 60 different species of small mammals, uh, birds, uh, pretty much anything that you might expect to run into um, when you're on a trail or in the forest. Uh, this is a representative of 17 different camera trap projects and over 850 camera trap locations. Um, so a really, really cool data set. Uh, I think the hardest part for me is just narrowing it down and figuring out how to make it as small enough that we can actually do anything with it. Um, so my approaches right now are just to say, we should probably be using a pretty substantial amount of the predator images that we've got, because um, those are kind of like the, the smallest class. And then, really, really subsampling that 6.5 million images of anything else that's not a predator. Um, and I think there's, for the uh, the application aspect of this, I think there's probably going to be really, uh, it, it'll be really important to exclude some cameras from the prototyping data set, because I think the application of this is to set this camera and the Sentinel device in areas that have never been seen before. Um, and to be able to pull predators out of those, um, uh, in, especially in locations where, sorry, the max about to die. Great. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, in places that the cameras have not been set before, um, that'll be really important. And so short-term goal, it's really just a, a binary classifier. It says there's a predator in this or there's not a predator in this. Um, Ideally, we would like it to predict predator more often than not, because this is kind of a use case scenario where if you're saying there's not a predator, but there is, there's high potential for conflict. Um, so it could be potentially risky um, if we are, yeah, if we are detecting or, or saying that there's not a predator when there actually is. Um, the long-term goal is to basically be able to develop species specific classifiers to allow for targeted monitoring. Um, if, if you watch the news around Washington, you might know that two weeks ago, an eight year old was dragged out of his campground by a mountain lion. And um, the rangers in Olympic National Park are now basically hunting that mountain lion trying to figure out where it's at. So this would be really fantastic to be able to deploy a sentinel in these areas and get an immediate notification of where that mountain lion is. Unfortunately, they'll go out and pull that mountain lion, but that's just kind of the nature of conflict. Um, but there's also potential use for elk conflict mitigation. Um, again, in Olympic, some of the rangers that I've talked to, they have to go around and shoot elk with paintball guns to scare them out of campgrounds because they have been charging campers. So, um, yeah, I mean, we could be using this for, for a ton of different things um, in the long term. Have you thought about um, trying to explicitly in your evaluation um, capture something around like maybe like human time effort um, working with the model? So if you have to tune up the precision for predators to the extent that now you're going to be having some false positives and then those need to be reviewed by humans, like actually capturing that in your um, evaluation so that you can select a model that's kind of like, or any user could select a model that's kind of the right trade-off for that in terms of how like potentially high risk they're willing to do versus how much time that's going to take them in reviewing predictions. Yeah, no, that's a that's a great idea. I think especially when you think of like the difference between detecting a cougar versus detecting an elk is like pretty substantial in terms of the risk. Uh, so I think yeah, that's a that's a fantastic idea that I hadn't really thought too much about. Um, Conservation X does have like a 
a website, uh, like a portal that you can kind of upload your own models and, and it'll, you'll be able to view whatever images are coming in. Um, I, I think they're at a pretty low resolution, but uh, I think the platform that they've got could be also really helpful for identifying false positives because you'll be able to see that image. And, and for the rangers in particular, that's pretty useful to just look online and say, oh, we got a cougar detection, but it's not actually a cougar, so we're not actually going to send anybody out there. Over there? Uh, that was that was you answered my question. I was curious. I think I'm a little bit familiar with conservation uh, with the Sentinel, uh, and my understanding is it's using Swarm, right? It's like the backhaul for the uploads. Swarm Sorry, could you, could you repeat that last part? Uh, my understanding of of the um, Sentinel is they're using like Swarm as the uh, satellite provider for uploading, um, you know, detection metadata. I was curious if they actually if they provided like the images themselves in the payload as well, and you could review them. Sounds like they do. Um, I think so. I, to be honest, I got this in the mail on Saturday and so I haven't, <laughs> haven't toyed around with it just yet. Um, yeah, Conservation X they had a fire in their office, so they were, they've been a little oh, scattered. Yeah. <laughs> so our communications have been like a little iffy. Um, but now that I've got this, yeah, I'll be able to dig into that a little more. And yeah, they are using Swarm, I think. So the SpaceX satellite program, um, it should be pretty good connectivity um, worldwide. I think, yeah, they're, they're starting to deploy all over the place. Um, I think I didn't fully understand how Sentinel, the Sentinel device works. Uh, it's completely new to me. And did I get it right? You can upload an AI model on it and then it's connected with your camera and it does real-time detection or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so basically you could plug this into your computer. Yeah. And you can drag whatever scripts you've written over to this module mm -hmm. and yeah, run your own models, whatever you want. And do you know how, like how long the battery lasts? Because usually when you run an, an AI model, it drags a lot of energy from the battery. So I'm, I'm curious how, this, how they manage to. There are six slots for an 18650 battery in here, which is a pretty, pretty strong battery. Um, I don't know how long that'll actually run. Mm -hmm. But, that so, also depends on how frequently you're detecting images yeah. and how big they are and how big the model is. Yeah. There's yeah. a bunch of other factors, yeah. so it would probably depend. Uh, but I, I think the really kind of cool thing that the Conservation X guys did with this is they, instead of designing an entirely new camera with the GPU on board, they designed it to plug into existing camera traps. So it got plugged, it's basically via the SD card slot. So it has like this little thing looks like an SD card. Yeah. So the entire, so you can use it with sort of theoretically any camera, but then you'd really want your model to possibly be trained for the, that type of camera. All right, camera. yeah. So this is like a nano GPU there, or like what is yeah. it? I don't remember exactly which GPU they use. They, they've, been, they've been developing this thing for maybe two, three years now. Cool. Couple, maybe even longer. Yeah. Yeah, I think the, the real nice thing is that I'm actually really impressed that you have one physically in your hand. Yeah, because yeah. this was like a long, <laughs> long time coming. <laughs> yeah, it was really hard to get. <laughs> um, yeah, I think the, the use uh, of having something that's not like a completely new camera is really useful for research labs that, you know, I worked with the Wildlife Coexistence Lab at University of British Columbia, and they've got 300 Reconyx Hyperfires. They're not getting rid of those. They're not going to buy all new cameras. It's super expensive. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it's nice to have something like this that you can just attach to that rather than having to buy a new camera. How, how much did you pay for it? How much was this? Yeah. Oh, I got it for free. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know how much it's going to be when they actually start selling it. Yeah, I think Michael's like a collaborator. He's got like a beta beta version, right? Yeah. Basically. Yeah, this like is not, not for sale yet. Not yet. Oh, um, right, yeah. Available yeah. to the public. Could there be a system of that where cameras communicate with one central location? That's like that's what Natty. So Natty is the other person who's doing real time, um, and he has a whole completely different system that he mostly built out. I'll just um, wait. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, yeah that's we'll the, that. the they call that or what I've learned that that's called is like rather than performing inference on the edge, like on the actual close to the device itself. Um, there are different camera manufacturers that can transmit their images like from camera to camera or via repeater links, yeah. make it to a central sort of like 
base station and then run inference there and they call that the inference mix in the and fog. Larger battery attached to a thing. And it's yeah, cool. yeah. Um, and I'm gonna to touch a little bit on that kind of thing. And, yeah, cool. Yeah. Thanks. Cool. Guys, uh, my name is Michaela. I use she, her pronouns. I am a second year PhD student at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, and I do bioacoustics. Uh, so sound, low frequency baleen whale sounds, um, but we convert everything to spectrograms. So that's why we can do image-based classification. This is a blue whale, um, and these are blue whale sounds. These are blue whale decals, and this is the training data set that I'm bringing to the class. So the goal, the overarching goal is to detect and classify um, these calls among a few others in spectrograms. Um, the data set I have comes from these seafloor moored hydrophones that just continuously collect passive acoustic data. We have, uh, the data set that I have has, is from two different locations and then four um, different data sets, four different like deployments and here we have, there's four calls, but I think because it's so, it's data sets pretty unbalanced, I'm just gonna use three of them, the A call, B call, and D call. And then I also have annotated in a noise category. Um, those are like the negatives you see here. And yeah, the goal is to, first of all, just like learn about computer vision and learn how to code in Python, which are two things I know relatively nothing about, um, and to hopefully build a prototype object detection model that can detect and classify um, these three different call types in the spectrogram. So this is just like an example of the data I have right now. Um, the calls can be pretty variable, and in those different deployments, there's different background noise conditions just based on the hydrophone system and things like that. Um, is that box on the top one and the, the one below, are those identical actually? Those actually are identical. I did some data augmentation where I just like randomized the start time cool. of the 30 second window so that I could have more examples. Uh, but yes, good eye. Of course you have a good eye, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, those are, that happens to be, and I two identical examples, but like the image itself is different. Yep. Um, but yeah, hopefully, object detection, but we'll see how it goes. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. Classification calls. What are the different classifications? Yeah, um, you know, like, um, what it, was it, what does it connote for the whale? Yeah, so um, there is a blue whale D call, which is associated with foraging. That's this little down sweep squiggle in the top uh, corner, and then that's often followed by a blue whale A call, which is associated with reproduction that only males make, and then also the blue whale B call, uh, which is down at the bottom. Um, I ha actually have some audio examples, so if anyone wants to hear these, then yeah, yeah. cool, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't skip it. <laughs> How's everyone doing? Um, we're about ha we're halfway through, so do we want to take a quick five minute break? Are people still engaged, or do we need like a minute? Yeah, we really need bathroom. Yeah, okay, five minutes, and then we'll come back. <laughs> Um, my ex yeah. But it's not in this case, it's not like the real time, I mean, it's, it's just off. like seconds. Okay. Uh, like seconds time. to lapse since you started. Like, uh, kind of. It's even, it's like you have real time originally, and then. 
the spectrum is just like a time frequency representation of sound. It would be like an FFT, yeah. fast Fourier transform, which um, is everything based on like the parameters you give it. And so it's like mine is just like 500 pixels by like 200 pixels. And like one of them represents time bins and then one of them represents frequency bins. And then in each of those bins is like the relative amplitude of that bin. And that makes up like the picture. Do you plan to like always give it, say, a 30 second window where it's like a live thing that comes through that? Um, no, because it's a fine. problem I always, or yeah, but when you feed it like a really long recording, or do you split it up each time? We're gonna bin it, split it up each time. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I see. It's always something I've been at, like in the past, I've had to like split it up, but then I cut it in half each time, if that makes sense. It's all overlaps, but I don't think there's a better way of doing right. it, right? Yeah, so that's another do. thing. I'm not gonna uh, worry about that right now because, like, I'm just doing yeah. the training. And yeah, I guess if you're just about making the model, that's, that's, that's right. more a problem for like. But when you're running sprints, you have to like have some overlap, or even if you saw there, like, you're gonna or like you're gonna get like one little model, and then you're gonna try to like classify that, and it's gonna be wrong or whatever. Yeah. Or you're gonna like split it in half, so it won't be able to get that, and so you have to have like. Whatever you're calling it is, like half of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's exactly like I've had before as well. But I, I don't know if that's just like the best way to do it. Or I feel like it's, I don't know what else. Yeah. Unless you yeah, have like, then, you can you detect use, like a little tiny piece of the call. Yeah, that's right. I guess it's tricky as well. If you trained on those tiny you know, cutoff so bits, they expired, get confused. Yeah, right. And then you're going to have like, yeah. 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 The way I did it is I said, okay, you should have at least three seconds of a call for some of the calls, and then like for some of the other calls, it's like six seconds. Based on what I know about the calls, if you have at least that much, then if you don't include it, then don't include it for this. I don't know. Yeah. Three seconds. No. Yeah. Let me try it out. Yeah. It's back to the year. I don't know. Yeah. 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 I think. There's said, like, I can do it with the fire. But the thing about these people is that they show up somewhere, and they're just like, they're amazing. And, like, you look at a person, you know, and sometimes like, there's some more. Yeah, that's why you want Yeah, or just like at least multi. Like, I don't want just one. Or the alternative is that you make smaller. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, if you've got those long groups, they can still overlap. Yeah, is it right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 like, we don't really know how they're going to do it. Like, I don't know. 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 Are they in, like, more than three ways? Um, not in my case. But, yeah, there's a lot of different yeah, I mean, they're in the right. Yeah, yeah. So, like, I'm not going to be in
Um, okay, well, I'm Ben. Um, thank you so much for having us here, for organising the workshop. Um, and what I've been working on for the last few years is the soundscape of coral reefs. So there's a lot we can actually learn about these habitats by listening to them. A healthy reef sounds very different to a degraded reef. Um, and a broad overview of my project is we've got data from all around the world. And I want to start developing a kind of pre-trained model that can be used as a foundation for other tasks like classification or clustering. Uh, because I've used um, industry standard pre-trained models, which work all right on core reef audio, but we found if we train our own, they're often better. So something to provide a base to work off there. Um, so I have access to many terabytes of coral reef recordings, but most of this is unannotated. Um, I've got data from 25 different sites around the world, 80,000, about two seconds long. Um, and I've tried to prep these in the right format. In summer school, I'm sure there'll be some teething issues. Um, but most of this data is, of a, a reef soundscape is just this background crackle of snapping trip. It sounds like a campfire. We're not always interested in that. We're more interested in things like the fish noise or the anthropogenic sounds. Um, and so the annotations to try and pull out these sounds of interest and train models that are focused on these rather than like 50 shades of different snapping trim, basically. Um, so here's my data set here. So um, I don't want to work on classification so much, but this does come in classes um, and it's unbalanced. We've got more data from certain sites in the world and some classes are overrepresented. Um, and this is labeled by experts and non-experts. So some have classes, some like this set on the left. They were just labeled by citizen scientists as having a sound of interest that isn't snapping trim. Um, so I want to think about balancing this with augmentation or maybe trimming it down for purposes of the summer school for prototyping. Um, and my goal is to, uh, like I say, try and develop an embedding extractor that is domain specific to coral reefs. Um, so I know one way to do that could be through something like an autoencoder, where you give it loads of examples of your recordings. Uh, it travels through the network. It learns this kind of condensed, compressed version of it um, and must reconstruct it from that. Then when it's finished training, um, you can actually use this. So you put in new data and you get out this feature embedding of your recordings. And then I have test data on the right here in pink that isn't included in the training data. And so those are like simple classification tasks that could be used to ground truth performance with embeddings from something like the autoencoder uh, to uh, a pre-trained industry standard one. Um, so yeah, that's my plan. So you have essentially like a set of downstream, like let's call them proxy tasks to yeah. evaluate how good your embedding is, but you actually want to use the embedding itself um, potentially as like a representation of how degraded coral reefs are. Um, more so, it would just form the foundation for, you could ask that question or it could be for anything. So we have one of these tasks is health integrated reefs, one is deep and shallow reefs, one is boats, one is bomb fishing, and then some are different fish noises. So basically just an embedding for anything that's coral reef sound related um, is the plan. Nice. Yes. Sorry, I'm not sure if I, I just misunderstood. What do you mean when you say embedding? Like yeah, I'm just not familiar with the That's time. my yeah. question. That's my oh, question. yeah, yeah. So um, I know with a lot of machine learning approaches, you can put in your data, say, like your image, and it will extract a feature embedding, which is basically like a string of numbers, say, a thousand numbers that can be used to represent that data. Oh, yeah. That's a multivariate data set you can use to train, like a classification algorithm, or you can cluster your data using those embeddings. Oh. And it takes a lot of time to put together the diverse data sets and then train models and large data sets to produce these. But if you then have a smaller data set, like a simple task, like you want to just identify one fish sound, it gives you a really good, like, warm start model to work on. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Presentation. Mm. Cool. Uh, thank you. Numbers. <laughs> Uh, hey everybody, uh, I'm Nathaniel, I go by Natty, um, and my background's in software engineering. I work for the Nature Conservancy, which if maybe you're not familiar with, is a, a pretty large environmental nonprofit here in the US, mostly here in the US. Um, so uh, I guess a little bit of background about my project. Uh, I'm the lead developer of a camera trap app called Animal, um, 
and among other things, uh, Animal allows, uh, it can consume images coming off wireless camera traps um, that are uploading their full images to the cloud. So a little bit different than the configuration that Michael's working on. Um, and then once in the cloud, it can perform inference on them in real time. And the idea being that uh, if something of interest or concern is detected, uh, it can then send an automated alert. Um, and so there's like a couple, you know, use cases that having real-time camera trap alerts are, are applicable for, um, one of which is human wildlife conflict. Um, another, the, the primary use case that we're, we've been sort of prototyping the system for has been early invasive species uh, detection, uh, primarily on like island ecosystems, island ecosystems that like presumably have never seen these invasive, they have, invasive species have not arrived on them. Uh, as of yet, or they had the invasive species um, uh, previously kind of eradicated or removed. Um, so the problem we'll be working on, it's the right error here. Yeah, uh, the, the problem we'll be working on um, over the course of the workshop is um, essentially what we're trying to do, or like the core biosecurity is another term for invasive species detection and monitoring and management. Um, at its core, sort of using camera trap imagery and machine learning for biosecurity monitoring is uh, what I am told is referred to as like open set classification or like an anomaly detection problem. Um, so in the sense, uh, in other words, rather, uh, you have, uh, you kind of have a good sense of what the native fauna looks like in a given environment. You might've set up camera traps previously and I've been collecting a lot of data, um, but that's less what you care about kind of observing and detecting and setting alerts for. It's the things that are not there that you likely do not have uh, training data for um, that you're trying to detect. Um, so to kind of poke at this question a little bit, I'm, I'm going to take um, two approaches. And I'm also going to pick one potential invasive species. I'm using rats in this case um, because rats are one of the more ubiquitous invasive species and also one of the more uh, like problematic if they arrive on island ecosystems. Um, so essentially, I'm going to take um, uh, Mostly data and classes from an island that we work on called Santa Cruz Island, which is the uh, largest island in California. It's off the coast of Ventura, California. Um, and uh, supplement those with uh, rat images taken elsewhere, because as of up until this point, rats have never been on Santa Cruz Island. We don't have training data taken on camera traps on the island. Um, so first step is to train a multi-class classifier, kind of just treating those rats like any other class, pretending that they, you know, are from that native, uh, the local island ecosystem. Uh, and then the second approach is going to be using the same test set that includes those supplemented rat images, um, but de deriving a different sort of train and uh, validation set, train an autoencoder, which Ben just touched on, um, uh, exclusively on those sort of native uh, species distributions, and it sounds like I've lost. Oh, it sounds like Ben's using autoencoders in a slightly different way than than I'm uh, imagining using them. But um, uh, essentially, the idea is if you with <coughs> autoencoders, how I understand it is if you train the autoencoder on what you perceive to be sort of like the, the, the normal images, the native species it learns to uh, first encode or basically like deconstruct those images into that sort of uh, latent feature space that embeddings that Ben's hoping to extract. And then the second step is that it's, as you're doing that, it's also as a second stage, it's trying to um, reconstruct those images into their original, uh, you know, format. Um, and as it is trained, as it gets sort of better and better at doing this, it also is kind of with learning how to reconstruct the types of images and potentially the types of species that you have trained it on. And then when you go to sort of throw some rat images on it, it uh, at it from the, the test set, the idea is it won't really know how to reconstruct those rat images as well as the native ones. And you can measure that error, the reconstruction error, I guess it's called, um, and use that as a proxy for like, oh, maybe this is an anomalous species, something that's not supposed to be there. Take a look at it. Um, so where I'm at with the data prep is, um, I've, I, I, if you all are familiar with mega detector, you might have poked around the repo for it. They've got a pretty great, um, or it, it great for me who doesn't know much about this, uh, sort of some, some starting blocks and some workflows for getting started with camera uh, with classifier training. I essentially like stepped through one iteration of this. So downloaded all the images, um, downloaded the 
the, the, the island conservation camera trap data set from which I'm getting the rat images, did some cleaning, filtering, et cetera, um, combined them. Right now I've got about 87,000 annotations um, from 72 locations and um, you know, cropped out the bounty boxes and created the splits and took a first pass at training uh, the model using these um, scripts found in the Megatector repo. Uh, so in terms of next steps, I think I've like just completed that on Friday and I, I don't really know what I, what I did per se. So it's like going, <laughs> going back and understanding the, the code a little better. And uh, I, I guess sort of trying to play around with the splits, play with hyperparameters. I don't know. I don't know. But I, I guess the goal is to, again, sort of develop a better sense of the intuition and um, sort of how one steps through a classifier trading workflow. Um, and yes, that's where I'm at. We've, we've talked about this before, but I think one of the things that's fascinating about this problem is that you do not have any real test data, right? You've never seen a rat on this island before. So I do think maybe one thing that could be cool is taking, maybe you just hold out some of the island conservation um, camera trap data set locations that do have rats um, and use those as some test data too. So you have like some real test data sets of rats, particularly for that um, reconstruction mm -hmm. part of the problem. Like, does that actually work on real data? Um, and then, and then you can also kind of see how similar that is to your like constructed synthetic test data of like putting some of those rats in the existing camera traps on Santa Cruz. Anyway, it'll be fun to talk about yeah. different ways to think about evaluating yep. this because there's, because you want to get your, you want to be as confident as possible that it's working, but there is no such thing that like you're not going to go put a rat on Santa Cruz Island to test your machine learning model. So, I mean, we've talked about it. <laughs> <laughs> Make a big cage. <laughs> there's, there's precedent in New Zealand. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, regarding the, the, the whole camera pipeline, you mentioned at one point that you pass the image from one camera to another, and I'm wondering why, why do you need to do that before it sends yeah. the signal to the, to the cloud? Good, good question. So the, um, we, on Santa Cruz Island and a lot of the islands we work on, there, there isn't cell service. Um, we do use cellular camera traps where there is cell service because they're a lot cheaper than the alternative. The alternative are these, um, uh, there's a company called Buckeye that makes cameras that um, can can transmit their images sort of from one camera to another via a proprietary VHF radio protocol, um, which allows you to kind of extend, and also in a lot of these places, there are field stations where there's some sort of comms equipment like somewhere on the preserve where there is internet access. So that the reason why we use these is because we essentially like daisy chain the cameras from that point of internet connectivity out into the field um, to the places where we think are maybe most likely that uh, invasive might arrive, um, you know, so docks and places where ships might ground, things like that. Um, and it's it's a way to sort of extend that internet connectivity out, out beyond that hyper local spot. So this this increases your probability of actually sending signal to to the cloud. It, I understand. It, so, yeah. it basically makes it makes it possible to send data okay. to the cloud. So yeah, necessary. Yeah. Yeah, an alternative approach um, would be sort of using sort of a Sentinel device like what Michael's using. Um, the big difference, and the reason why I was curious about that sort of image in the payload is like we need to be absent. For starters, there are often uh, native rodents on these islands. Like uh, there's a paramiscus deer mice on Santa Cruz Island. They look pretty similar to rats. And so we need to have human eyeballs validating whether every rat detection is in fact a rat. Um, and so in order to do that, we need to have the, a, an image or at least a high enough resolution of the image in order for a human to make that determination. So um, the, in, this, in the case of like a sentinel, um, they, my understanding, but it sounds like I might be wrong. My previous understanding was that they're, they're running the, they're doing the inference right on the device. And they're transmitting like a text package that says, you know, rat was detected at 745 at this location mm -hmm. rather than the full image. But it sounds like maybe they actually are. So I think they submit a pretty low resolution yeah. image. Okay. Yeah. But yeah. so for small rodents, that might be like yeah. the, the ability to identify deer mouse versus rat if you've really downsampled the image might be tricky. But maybe there's a way to actually send adapt your model so you're sending the crop 
at high resolution mm -hmm. as opposed to sending the whole image at low resolution or something? Yeah, and I think, you know, they've got this whole platform that you can kind of select what data you want sent to you. So if you just want the text data, then I think you can have that. Or if you actually want like a little thumbnail, you can have yeah. that as well. So I think it's customizable. Yeah, I think in, in practice, is I, uh, any system sort of like what you're working on or what I'm working on, it's nice to be able to do both, you know? The advantage, for example, if you develop a, a predator versus not predator model um, and you're looking to kind of scale that up, many places you want to deploy cameras will probably have cell service, in which case it's going to be a lot cheaper from like a hardware perspective to do the cell, full transmission, inference on the cloud. But then, of course, you can't do it in places where there aren't. Right. So we face that all the time. Um, and yeah, nice to have just like a, a bunch of different options for different connectivity situations. Okay. Um, so are rats mainly arriving through like ships or something like that? Uh, yes. Yeah. I mean, rats can swim a really long way. It's shockingly, shockingly far. But, um, <laughs> uh, but in, for the most part, yeah, the, the, the most common sort of pathway is um, like ship, shipwrecks, yeah. ship grounding. Could, could you also explore like early detection systems at the point of entry? So maybe you'd need like, I know, yep. like a port background or or like a ship interior or, oh, like on, or something, or is that maybe unrealistic? No, no, that's not. We do set up cameras on the mainland right near, like in the Port of Ventura where all of the ships and ferries and whatever are like disembarking from. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's more just to get a, a sense of like the, the sort of pressure. We know there are rats there. It's just yeah. to get a sense of like, yeah. All right, we got to keep Sorry. going, but this is quite cool, and you all can talk more at lunch for sure. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, so my name is Jared Blair. Um, I'm a PhD student at the University of British Columbia, um, and my project is looking at um, these uh, terrestrial invertebrates uh, that were collected by the National Ecological Observatory Network, or NEON, uh, in the United States across these 47 sites sort of on the, on the map there. Um, the primary objective of this project when it was first sort of launched was uh, to collect uh, ground beetles or carabids in these pitfall traps, uh, shown on the bottom right there. Um, but they found that you know, it wasn't just uh, ground beetles falling into these traps, they were getting all kinds of little critters and um, that was you know, still data that could possibly be used, but they didn't have anybody exactly sorting it. Um, so uh, before I came onto the project, um, the people who were sort of running it uh, thought, hey, why don't we try using computer vision and DNA metabar coding to sort of sort through these uh, previously unsorted samples. Um, and so what we have is a data set of 100,000 like images, it's like cropped images, um, from uh, three, a little over 300 sampling events. So those would be uh, pitfall traps that were then collected and, and put into storage. Um, so the labeling of this data was all done by a single person, um, which is a pretty monumental task. Uh, and which, I mean, all, all credit to, his name is Mike, um, you know, for, for doing that, but, you know, one person can only have so much knowledge uh, on all of terrestrial invertebrates. Uh, so the, the labels uh, really vary in their specificity, all the way from phylum, so say like a worm, it's in the phylum Annelida, um, and he would just label all the worms as that, uh, all the way down to, in some cases, he would know the, the actual species name. He was sort of an ant guy, so a lot of the ants have uh, higher level specificity or lower level, whatever you want to call that. Um, and then, so uh, I guess I should talk about the, the images. So the, the image is, you know, on the, on the far right there. Um, that's sort of how we uh, would photograph these specimens in bulk, um, sort of just dump them out onto a tray. I know the other insect folks were, uh, I, or were photographing live uh, specimens, fortunately. Uh, ours were dead, so they're easier to, to photograph. Um, and then uh, we used uh, Image Shade or Fiji to just sort of go through and uh, sort of automatically crop around all of those. So the actual training images are going to be, you know, say on the top there, all those beetles, um, the actual individual beetles rather than this whole image. 
um, and then the uh, the tubes that they were stored in, so the sort of falcon tube there, uh, they metabarcoded the uh, DNA from the ethanol of the storage tube, uh, sort of to get a list of, you know, presence of like what species are actually uh, in any of these uh, samples. Um, and a question I often get is like, why combine the uh, computer vision and the DNA metabarcoding sort of streams? Uh, and the reason for that is with DNA metabarcoding is pretty good at getting you know, species presence absence, but it can't really tell you abundance. Whereas the computer vision can say, you know, oh, this individual, it belongs to this you know, taxonomic group. Um, and then you can, you can sort of get abundance counts from that. Oh, yep. uh, what do you mean when you say metabarcoding? coding? Uh, so, uh, it, so we, we take the sort of like extracellular DNA from the, uh, uh, the tubes uh, and then uh, I guess to sort of put a barcode <laughs> that um, that extracellular DNA to sort of get a uh, a list of you know what's what DNA was detected in that that tube. So okay. they like parse out different um, chains of DNA that mm -hmm. then are identifiable yes. to species. Mm, okay. Sorry, I, I, I'm not on the, the metabarcode inside of things. So my, my knowledge is sort of at a sort of higher <laughs> level, but um, uh, yeah, it's. It, uh, like PCR kind of stuff. Okay, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, and so uh, the data set that I'll be working with. So as you can sort of see in the image on on the right there, um, we get a lot of uh, whole specimens, but then we also get a lot of whether it's debris or legs or you know just partial partial specimens. Um, for the sake of this project that I'll sort of be doing over the course of this, uh, this uh, summer school. Um, I'm sort of taking the easy route and just looking at the intact adults uh, and just trying to solve that problem first before getting into the weeds of everything else, uh, just because uh, there's actually more legs than actual uh, full insects. So uh, <laughs> it, it caused sort of a, a, a balancing problem with the data set. Um, and, and we're more interested in the, the whole insects anyway. Uh, but you know, down the road, just from a practicality standpoint, we'll probably have to address that. Um, the split for my data set uh, right now is a 80-20 uh, train test. Um, and then additionally, possibly doing, I call it zero shot. I feel like there's a few different definitions of exactly what zero shot is, but it's sort of re-including some of either the removed specimens that were uh, not abundant enough to be included in the training data set, um, or even some that are at, at too high of a taxonomic level to be included. Um, and try to classify those to uh, some sort of some sort of partially known group, I guess, sort of a, a higher level group. But don't want to get into the weeds of it too much. But um, yeah, do something like that. Uh, my graphs here. Um, the one on the left is so both of these are by site. Uh, the one on the left is more uh, what you would see across the entire data set if you average everything. Where it's you know there are there is some, some imbalance. Um, it's more of a, a steady slope down, but we do have some sites that were just dominated by one group. Uh, in this case, it was uh, Hymenoptera, so those are mostly ants um, that would just sort of dominate the uh, individual sites. So, I'd like to work on, on that a little bit. Um, the approach to uh, actually doing all this is going to be a multimodal model combining the image data with tabular data, uh, that being both the DNA data and then because we have location data. Uh, include that as well. Um, the first outcome that we're sort of hoping for, I guess, uh, is that through this combined approach that we would have better accuracy than just uh, uh, the images on their own, uh, sort of using the DNA as a way of uh, giving the model sort of a hint as to like what's in any given sample, uh, and then hopefully that um, improves accuracy. The other thing too would be um, sort of outside of the um, traditional computer vision workflow would be improving the specificity of the classifications as well. So say if uh, for any given sample, um, the model identifies something as a beetle, uh, but the DNA says that there's only one beetle in that sample, uh, in one beetle species, uh, then perhaps if we you know, identify them at say the order level or family level, um, we can actually narrow it down to, oh, this is probably that species because the DNA only detected that one of species. Or even if there was, say, like two species, that's still more useful than just saying that, oh, this is a beetle. It's, oh, it's a beetle of you know, one of these two species kind of thing. Um, and there's a few ways I 
looking at at uh, working through that, but won't get too much. Anyway, that's uh, I guess mostly it. Awesome. Are you going to train a baseline without the DNA? Uh, yes. Yeah, 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 for sure. So just there'll be one that's just the images and then another one that includes the, the others as well, just to see how much it improves. Oh, hopefully it improves. Yeah. Oh. Cool. Very cool. Hello, um, I'm Kara Apple. Um, I'm a PhD student at Oregon State University, and I'm also affiliated with the U.S. Forest Service. Um, and my project is working on classifying wildlife species in camera trap images from Western Oregon. Sort of the broader context for this project, um, the Forest Service has um, established a large passive acoustic monitoring program in the Pacific Northwest for northern spotted owls, which um, is my primary project for my, my PhD, but we're sort of leveraging that field effort to um, try to monitor other wildlife as well. So we have, um, we've worked hard to make it a randomized enough design so it's not just owl specific. Um, and so at a subset of the sites where we are doing passive acoustics for owls, we're also setting up camera traps to survey the mammal communities. Um, and in terms of research goals, it's um, just sort of broader um, forest community, wildlife community composition and associations with old growth and forest disturbance and that type of thing. Um, so we've been collecting data at um, 480 of these sites for four years. Um, starting in 2019, we placed one camera at, um, at each of these sites in Western Oregon when the crews would go out and put up the acoustic recorders. We also had them put up a trail camera. And then in 2020, we actually had them put up two cameras. So, um, you know, most of the time when we set these, it's kind of on a game trail for larger, medium to large um, bodied mammals. But we also wanted to survey small mammals. So we, we placed um, cameras kind of pointing more towards the ground. Um, so there are sort of different levels of, of the data here. Um, and these cameras are out for about six weeks each summer. We have um, a lot of data. Um, over 100,000 labeled images. Um, I might pull that a bit for this. We were labeling images up till like last week, so I need to kind of update this um, to see how balanced the data set is. Um, what we I did focus hard on this summer. We're bumping up most of the species to at least a thousand training images, so it's not quite this Im imbalanced, but just sort of an idea. Like we have way too many photos of elk, deer, and Douglas squirrels, and you know, not that many of um, some of the rarer species, but we're trying to balance that a bit. Um, I have 39 species classes here. And I also incorporated some data from additional projects. So we have collaborators also doing camera trap projects in um, Western Oregon, and they've contributed some photos to this as well. Um, some of those are slightly different setups where they have bait stations. So there will be different kind of backgrounds and um, fields of vision and the cameras that are in our, in our data. Um, but we want this model to be applicable, not just to our same cameras in future years, but also to new like out of sample sites. Um, so that, you know, we thought that was important to include other data sets. Um, yeah, just a basic kind of species ID um, goal here. Yeah. Are your baited stations like a, a carcass in view of the camera? Um, it's not a carcass, it's a sardine can. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have a picture, but like for skunks, for example, there's a project, um, they're mostly carnivore projects. So they, they have like a, a tree in view and then like a sardine can. And then like some of them have like a, a sign, you know, with a site name or something. Yeah. Um, so I don't know how the model, I don't know what the model will think. What, are, what are the big pushes from mega detector B4 to B5 was uh -huh. doing a better job with bait station. Oh, okay. And it was really bad before because the animals all would like stand up on their hind legs yeah. on the tree to like get at the bait. And then you're just getting these poses that were like not seen. And so anyway. Oh yeah, Maybe Hector V5 should be better with bait stations, but classification, I can tell you, yep, it's weird. Weird poses are hard for computer vision. So. That's a great point. Like a spotted skunk profile will look a lot different from a spotted skunk like posing up a tree. Yeah, yeah. yeah we don't use bait stations in our cameras, so um, it'll be interesting, like including some of these 
photos from other studies that have them. Or if nothing else, do. you can just have it as a really hard out of distribution it, evaluation set. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see how it does. Yeah. Cool. All right, I'm I'm like now trying to crank. Yeah, yeah. Like, um, realize we're like into lunch. Just use the right and it's okay. Okay. Uh, so he hello everyone. I'm Artem Brzezinovic. I'm from Slovenia. Uh, I'm from the Josef Stefan Institute, um, where I work uh, at the Department for Knowledge Technologies, um, which is mainly dealing with natural language processing, but I was always a bit more interested in natural sciences, so I was tending to work more on ecological um, projects uh, and natural science projects. Uh, so I'm finishing my PhD, uh, which is uh, about uh, explainable machine learning uh, in, um, on heterogeneous data in life sciences. Many of these have been like ecological projects, uh, like soil biodiversity, where I was working on uh, graph structure data, uh, but also uh, in marine biology, where, where I have been predicting uh, harmful algae blooms and the toxicity accumulation in uh, seashells. And that's also how I came uh, to this project, because I always wanted to work with, uh, with images as well. And that's why I started collaborating with the National Institute of Biology. Which, um, which is work, which is analyzing and studying uh, uh, ocean uh, microorganisms. And uh, for this project, um, uh, I have decided to, to build like a computer vision system, which can identify uh, and, and count phytoplankton species uh, of interest, and also calculate the biovolume uh, in the specimen from the microscopic images that they're generating. Uh, so this is Piran on the top, uh, top right, uh, which is the spot where this uh, where the sampling is uh, taking place. This is the National Institute of Biology, the Marine Biology Station, and this is actually just so that you have an idea. It's in the Adriatic Sea, completely on the on the top uh, on the north of the Adriatic Sea, which is called like the the Gulf of Trieste, uh, and uh, so all the samples that they are from here. Uh, so the originally. Uh, we have uh, labeled this phytoplankton microscopic images, and we have, I mean, they have a lot of different species, but unfortunately, they didn't have that many images as we need them for computer vision. So we have actually focused on two of the main species, which is the Pseudonychia delicatissima and Pseudonychia calianta. And they have been doing uh, prudently microscopy in the last uh, months, and we, we gathered 168 images of the first and 139 of the second species, but you have to know that in each of these images there are several cells visible. So we have more or less 300 to 400 uh, uh, um, annotations for each of the two species. Uh, and this is like, these microscopic images are on like 400 uh, times magnification, so it's a bit uh, uh, like higher magnification than what Venetius was showing before. And also this is uh, being done manually, so there is no automation yet, and that was the idea that as soon as this monitoring becomes a bit more automatic, we would be able then also to, to do uh, classification and uh, the, the uh, biovolume estimations that I am after in this project. Uh, so in terms of the data labeling approach, uh, um, one person has been doing this manual, uh, manual class, has been adding manual class labels, uh, the bounding boxes, as well as the, the segmentation masks uh, in, the, in the program CWAT. AI, so because the, the aim of the, the project is instant segmentation, we want to identify specific cells, uh, not only the, the, the label, and so that's why we, we need, uh, we need uh, masks, uh, segmentation masks uh, in the data set. Uh, we, uh, in, together with, uh, 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 with, with additional assistance, we have been also trying out, I mean, we had the idea of, uh, to try out uh, meta segment anything model, which I was really uh, happy that it just came out this year and it sounded like quite exciting as a as a foundation model like in natural language processing this seems to be very prom promising for visual for visual data and actually it worked quite well when you had to, when you uh, add the prompt like a point or a bounding box it actually does a quite a good job in terms of predicting the the masks uh, but for our purposes unfortunately it didn't work that well because the cells are connected to each other so it actually 
uh, uh, produce a segmentation mask for all of the cells, but we need individual ones. But it, it's still uh, quite applicable for uh, like other protocols for other purposes in future. Uh, so yeah, uh, uh, we uh, I also plan to do some image augmentation to also increase the number of of the images, and I hope that with the, together with the instructors and teaching assistants, we'll find a way to even increase this data set. Uh, so that's how these images look like. Uh, these are the two uh, species. And at the end of the, uh, uh, the workshops, I want to predict this mask and also the label of, of the specimen that we're looking at. So the, the, the planned approach is to train various computer vision models for instance segmentation uh, for these two species of interest. And we'll be using like 70%, for instance, of images for for training, so for the class labels and the segmentation mask, which includes these class labels and segmentation masks. And then we will test the predictions, so the labels and the masks with the remaining uh, images. Um, and then at the end is also the goal to actually es estimate the biovolume, which can be done based on the number of pixels that are in the mask, which is very simple <laughs> if you just follow this approach. But also another way would be to just uh, measure the, the two pixels that are the fur furthest apart and then just use like a formula to somehow estimate how, how big the, 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 the cell is. And this is actually very important because the research of this National Institute of Biology is actually after um, the community structure of, of the phytoplankton, not just only the, the abundance. They really want to see how the size of the of the phytoplankton is changing due to environmental pressures, due to climate change or other anthropomorphic uh, and anthropogenic pressures. And through that, we could then in the future see how the cells are actually changing. And this has very important impact on the ecosystem, marine ecosystem functions uh, that are so important for us, like a carbon pump and uh, the whole um, uh, like uh, food webs, which, which are depend completely on this primary product producers of organic matter. Thank you. <laughs> um, maybe just for the sake of time, we do like questions at lunch. No worries. Yeah. <laughs> bon appétit. <laughs> bon appétit, yeah. <laughs> uh, oh. Uh, further on, sorry. Chris. Next is Chris. We just have a couple more people. We're going to make it. <laughs> yeah, I'm Chris, and I'm from UNSW in Sydney. Um, yeah, so the, basically the idea for my project is to try and extract information from the background of underwater photos, so in this case, my naturalist photos. Um, and yeah, so I'm just focusing on kelp, um, the type of algae. I guess the idea behind this is that my naturalist is a great resource, lots of photos, you know, maybe um, for a lot of things, but uh, often it's focused on quite the charismatic <laughs> species like fish, um, and people don't often take and submit photos of things like kelp, but they're rather important. Um, and the reason I'm focusing on kelp is, well, partly to make it easier just doing one species rather than trying to do everything at once. Um, but it's also, it's, um, it's disappearing. So climate change and warming waters, it's retracting from its northern part of its range. Um, and uh, yeah, it's other herbivores move south and sort of eating it. So. The idea is that if you can uh, potentially you know, get a model that can detect it in the background, you can hopefully early detect where it's starting to disappear from. Um, and I guess it's sort of a prototype idea. So using kelp to test the idea, but ultimately hopefully use it for other um, habitats of interest, you know, coral reefs and stuff like that, and get early warnings of you know, bleaching events or something like that. Um, so data set is relatively small in the scheme of things, primarily because I end up having to redo it for this course. Um, so I haven't done that many, but it's also pretty quick, so I could do more. Um, I guess one of the first steps in it, because of the type of data it is, is there's a sort of a usability issue. Um, you know, they're, not, um, they're not designed for what they're necessarily doing, so obviously 
this potentially in focus, but the background is completely useless in some photos. It's either blurry or, you know, they're fish photos. So some of them are people's fishing photos. They're on land, so obviously detecting the presence of kelp on a photo of a dead fish is not useful. Um, so it's potentially the first stage of trying to get it just to useful images. Um, and then, yet yeah, ultimately just try and do presence absence in the photos. And I guess, um, yeah, unbalanced in my one in the sense that it's mainly absent just because I'm targeting one species, so obviously it's not in all the photos, so it's going to have a lot less to learn from in terms of what I'm actually looking for compared to the photos where it's not, not there. Um, so if I have to do something about that. Um, uh, last one here is just um, sort of split up by regions, which yeah, cause ultimately I guess the idea is to try and map its distribution, so um, well, it, it, to learn presence absence in sort of different types of um, Habitats, not just ones where it's common. Um, yeah, so the goal is basically, yeah, so possibly a preliminary step of trying to detect what a usable photo is um, and get, get rid of the ones that aren't really suitable for the now asking the question. Uh, and then, yeah, ultimately determine the presence absence of, of the kelp in the background of photos. My name is Chris. I'll be really brief. So I'm a co-PI on the Antarctic Penguin Biogeography Project. Basically, the goal of that project is to um, identify the abundance and distribution of penguins across Antarctica. And so this has been accomplished through a lot of ground counts over the years, but it's very expensive and hard to go to Antarctica. And so you can actually also see penguins from space really easily. This um, pink stuff is their poo or their uh, guano, and they tend to poop in their nest areas. And because they pack in this free sort of reliable way when they're nesting, you can um, infer the number of penguins from uh, the guano. So the goal is to actually identify this pinkish guano stains from satellite, um, from Landsat imagery. So what I'm doing is building this uh, pipeline where we uh, acquire all these Landsat images going back to the 70s, continent-wide, and we co-register these stains because in Antarctica, um, uh, there really are no ground control points. So these images are often um, uh, out of position with one another. And then why I'm here is using these machine learning methods. The goal is to classify guano and then to use that in models of penguin population dynamics. And so I spent a lot of time building this uh, pipeline in R where we uh, have teams of individuals that cloud clear images and they co-register the images. And then in the end, what we wind up with is a data set um, which is here, which you can see uh, a Landsat image underneath. And we've paired that with um, worldview imagery, which is a much higher resolution, a typical Landsat pixels, about 30 meters by 30 meters. Worldview is about a meter and a half by a meter and a half. And in worldview, you can actually see the penguin guano directly. So someone, um, um, with, uh, my collaborator, Dr. Heather Lynch, her students, have spent a long time uh, painstakingly annotating that um, PHR imagery of guano, which we then place on top of the Landsat imagery and that allows us to assign each pixel as having guano or not and how much guano is in the pixel. And so this is kind of the result of that was one of these overlay themes where the, it's hard to see, but the color of that pixel would tell the percentage guano in there. And so for the course, uh, my goal is to, um, I'd like to actually uh, classify pixels as yes, no for guano, the amount of guano in the pixel and some uh, understanding of the uncertainty in that process. Um, so those are the, the three components I'm trying to do. So, yeah, thanks. Here. My name is Kyra. I'm from the Conservation Technology Lab at the San Diego Zoo. I am going to be building out a software tool that one of our summer fellows had started last year. We call it Unicorn. Um, the goal is to have sort of a framework of tools, uh, models to do unsupervised clustering of individuals of a particular species 
once they've been classified. And so for this, I have two data sets. I have spots and stripes. Uh, the Jaguar data set is from our own researchers. It spans five years. We have approximately 2,000 images uh, manually labeled. Um, we have about 30 individuals within that data set. Uh, the second data set is a open source data set of tigers from, I believe, China, 92 individuals, all of which have been labeled. Uh, the cool thing about the Jaguar data set is that we have um, a bunch of other information, such as where the camera traps were located, how far apart they were to each other. Uh, and we also have left-right viewpoint, which makes it a little bit easier to cut down on computation time because you only have to compare left side to left side when you're making spot identification. Um, so there's a bunch of different things that need to be done with this project. Um, one of the basic things is just improving image quality. It's really hard to compare images when they're blurry or too dark. Um, so just doing like basic image adjustment, auto detecting whether or not they're too dark, that kind of a thing. Um, both data sets are using SIFT features, um, but I am open to exploring other embeddings, uh, hopefully maybe getting some other ideas throughout this course. Um, and then, like I said, using uh, things like the viewpoint, the location, to sort of uh, build out a Bayesian framework for um, maybe simplifying the clustering algorithm. Um, but the bulk of the project, I think, will be exploring various clustering algorithms. Hello, <laughs> I'm Naya, she, they, that's not a real cichlid, it was generated by Dali, <laughs> I tricked one of the world leading experts in cichlid species identification into thinking it was a real cichlid, so I was very proud of that, so I'm going to show it to you all now. Um, my project is focused on evaluating the role of locomotor activity in the species diversification of cichlids, which are part of one of the largest rapid radiations in recent evolutionary time. Um, the way that we're doing that is um, specifically thinking about uh, temporal niche partitioning. We already know a lot of the ways that cichlids divide up their environment and how they to manage access to resources in such a small environment, considering the number of species that are, are present. Um, and the way that we're doing that is by taking 24 hour video of these fish in laboratory settings. And it is using IR cameras, which generally, at least these cameras generate kind of uh, low quality uh, I, black and white videos, which can make it look more like there's a smudge moving around than a real fish. Uh, so part of the challenge here is uh, training a model that can accurately detect the fish, as well as comparing across time. There is a fish here moving, it crosses into a shadow, completely disappears, and then comes out on the other side and not losing that tracking or um, having a, an identity switch in those moments, uh, especially when we have group films where there's a lot of crossover and occlusion happening. Uh, we do have a large amount of sample. There is no duplicated individuals in this data set. Um, and we are focusing right now, as you can see, on this hybrid uh, between two different uh, phenotypes of the circadian rhythm and trying to look at the genetic background of the timing of these locomotor events. Um, are we a highly active species that is always highly active? Are we a highly active species that is active during the day or during the night? Um, or are we a low active species? And how does a uh, group housing of all of these uh, various phenotypes uh, affect uh, so something as plastic as when you go to sleep. I think all of us traveling from all over know that we can very rapidly change exactly how and when we are waking up and going to sleep. And uh, uh, fish also have these patterns in their activity. Um, my prototyping data set will be around five to 7,000 images and I hope we all get to eat lunch soon. <laughs> <laughs> I, can you next? I think you're the last person. Yes. Okay, so that was uh, a bit of a marathon, I think, but it's really cool to see all the different things that everyone's doing. I would recommend that maybe as we walk over to lunch, you try to find someone who has what you think is maybe some sort of shared challenge with what uh, you brought up. 
um, and maybe try to sit with them. Um, and with that, let's all uh, let's all head over to where the cafeteria is. Um, and you know, we can kind of disperse a bit, but we'll all be back here at one p.m. Can people Um. I'm not going to leave my laptop here right. because I'm just a bit cautious yeah. with my laptop. Technically, I think it would be fun, but a lot of people have the code and just, like anyone at Caltech. Not that I think someone at Caltech is going to steal your laptop. Mm -hmm.